Welcome, welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Montez, and this is the VAU Mic Check. Today, we're going to be talking more about business, just like I said, you know, just like I said this past Wednesday. So today, we have another smaller crowd. That's totally okay. It's the day before the Super Bowl, so I don't want to keep everybody here. You know, you got to go out, get stuff ready, have some fun, because you know, we're probably gonna have a party tomorrow, right? But anyway, so <laughs> today, one of the main focuses that I wanted to talk about was um, actually getting work. And um, interestingly enough, we were talking about uh, the different genres of VO and, and opportunities in them just before the Hangout started, which it normally starts about an hour before the, the broadcast, should I say. And um, Amber here actually had the opportunity to uh, listen to a panel about casting. And uh, what was the name of that guy? Uh, um, J. Michael Tatum um, was part of a Funimation panel. Um, but there was the Justin Smith, I think was his name, that was a producer. He was a voice actor, and now he's a, a producer for... Uh, Justin Cook, I'm sorry. Justin Cook um, was another one that was on the panel. And Lisa Ortiz, or I think she's just a voice Lisa actor. Lisa Ortiz. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa Ortiz. I've met her. Oh, okay. She's a sweetheart. She's very, very cool. little spitfire. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but is, yeah, it was it was neat to hear their casting process because they had a panel completely on casting um, where they they um, gave us the opportunity to ask how they did their casting and discuss their processes and why they hired the people that they hired and it was a little discouraging just because um, a lot of what they do is people that they know or people that they know who know somebody or agents who have actually been successful. Um, sent them successful voice actors that um, were timely and great, and they they returned back to those agents to have more people thrown at them. Um, but on the on the upside, it sounds like um, Funimation is constantly constantly looking for fresh voices. That was one thing they made really clear is that I guess there is some pressure on them to find those fresh voices. So they're in their community theater community there in the area looking for actual actors um, to bring in an actual J. Michael Tatum was one of them who was kind of coerced actually tricked into getting into the studio uh, they told him they just needed a warm body when he kept refusing for I think several almost a month month and a half and then uh, finally got him in and as a warm body and by the time he left he'd already recorded his first segment <laughs> and he was hooked after that and to look at his IMDB someone else pointed out um, that I mean, he's done a ton of anime since then. Ton. Well, just rewinding a little bit more but before that, um, the, the, the major thing about being a voice actor is uh, getting out there and having work. Because you can call yourself a voice actor, but um, until you've actually started really, really devoting yourself to it and really getting out there and looking for work and finding work, I mean, landing the job doesn't necessarily mean it for you, but you know, being an active voice actor, looking for the opportunities to act. Um, there are actually a lot more opportunities that even the people who have the opportunities don't know about. Uh, one of the main things is, is it's, it's important to uh, educate your potential clients about the work that you need done, uh, or work that they might need done and that you can do for them. But um, one, of the in, one of the most interesting places that you can go to find work would be uh, anime conventions, comic book conventions, movie conventions, places like that, because you'll be able to talk directly to producers, casters, directors, people who are really involved in all of that. And uh, Amber had the opportunity to go to some of these some of these events and be able to network with these people. Yes, um, and it actually occurred to me as um, and Mike, you were actually saying this earlier that. The voiceover work spans, uh, I mean, just a ton of different stuff, um, a ton of different genres, and and the more that you're kind of soaking yourself in the voiceover realm, the more you're realizing and picking up these different avenues. You know, even just sitting and watching the Super Bowl, sitting um, sitting and watching cartoons with your kid, um, and watching anime for me with um, one of my youth group kids made me realize, oh my gosh, this is voiceover work right here, and so realizing that voiceover conventions was something I needed to hit this year. That was, you're absolutely right. That was a huge realization for me, knowing I had to be at those events in order to meet the people who are in the industry and maybe be one of those people of somebody who knows somebody. Yeah. It's always good to uh, to connect with people, especially, you know, 
in places like that. My wife, though, <laughs> funny little story. She works at a, a quick service Japanese restaurant right now, and she had the incredible opportunity to meet the woman who, and she's this this woman is a regular in this, in my wife's store, but she was able to meet the woman who actually um, organizes Comic Con in L.A. every year. I had the opportunity to speak with her as well, and um, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there, uh, there's no guarantee that I'm going to get anything through it right now. But knowing her, she is a fountain of information. Yes, um, uh, Funimation is always looking for fresh voices, and Funimation should be somewhere we should absolutely go. But, but there's another company called Bang Zoom, which does a lot more. Uh, VO casting than Funimation. And this is directly from her, who organizes this year after year. The company is called Bang Zoom. I don't know how the submission works. I haven't gone there myself quite yet. I've been a little bit busy with some other voiceover work I've been doing. But um, there are opportunities all over the place. Yeah, Maddie, the, uh, the dog is... Mm -hmm. Yes, my dog. My dog wants to be famous. <laughs> but um, I know somebody who's done quite a bit of uh, voiceover work. Somebody who I would love to hear from is Jerome right now, actually, about where he's been able to get his work and where, you know, <clears throat> Jerome, like, how how have you picked up the work you've gotten, and uh, where do you normally go to uh, to get any repeat work if you've gotten any? Can you hear me, Mike? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, because. I was having dinner, but <laughs> um, so you kind of caught me off guard. Um, oh, that's okay. I use, having dinner I use a lot of uh, P to P, P to P sites, and they're all over the place. Um, if you have time to actually, what are the revenue to throw your your I guess your name in a hat? As far as the memberships are concerned, then they are very um, helpful. But the, I found that the trick is is to um, get into, I get get your auditions in as quickly as possible. Meaning, if you know, if I'm auditioning for a job and I see more than thirty or forty auditions, I won't even bother, because I'm I'm thinking from the casting agent's perspective, where they're only going to go through so many. They, they, you know, time is of the essence for them, and um, I figure if they don't find it in the first 40 auditions, then they're probably not going to. So I don't even waste time after, you know, a certain benchmark. <clears throat> so, you know, like uh, sites like Voices.com, uh, Voice123, um, there's a new one that I just ran across called Badalgo. So, you know, it's the sites are out there. You just got to do a little looking. Okay, and have, have you done your work exclusively through pay-to-play? Um, no, actually, um, some of the clients that I started working with on pay-to-play, once they got to know me, then they preferred to come to me directly, which <laughs> is their option. You know, I, I do have a, a website up. And, you know, they would be able to find me through normal conventional methods of, if that's what they wanted to do. So um, I, I actually, one of my funnier stories is that I was actually voicing a product for a male enhancement uh, product. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. And that, um, I kept it. <clears throat> oh, hold on. I kept that job for quite some time. And, you know, kind of like the guy that was doing the casting, he moved on to another job and it just kind of fell off. But um, that's, you know, if you have a presence out there, people will find you eventually. You know, you just got to stretch and be patient a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing is, um, the, one of the things that you, uh, that you brought up was about, you know, people coming to you and trying to drive traffic to your site. Um, that's one of the things that I've had a lot of difficulty with because, well, first of all, my site's down right now, so I'm not even going to go there. But before then, 
um, I had Google Analytics on, and uh, most of the views that I had were from me. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I know that there's a, there's a lot of resources out there to kind of uh, you know do SEO and to optimize things, but the real question I wanted to pose was um, uh, beyond just uh, having a social presence. Um, what else would you consider doing with a website? Like, what 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 more would you like? It, let's say that you had a professional website which had, you know, some some people going through it. Um, what would you do with it? Um, one one of the things that I do is. You know, when you're in a circle with people that may require voiceover work, because if you own a business, you have to advertise. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I do is I, I try to keep business cards on me at all times, you know, and I had them professionally made. And um, when I'm just even having a casual conversation with somebody, then I'll just give them a business card. You know, so when... I think that part of it is when you establish yourself and you do a good job, then a lot of business, you'll be surprised how much you get just by word of mouth. Hmm. But, you know, when, when I do different projects, I post them to social media, like uh, Facebook and Twitter. They're the only two that I really use consistently, but because I don't, I don't have a whole lot of time. <clears throat> yeah. So well, you know, I mean, what kind of what kind of responses have you had from Facebook and Twitter? Like, have you actually had people uh, like contact you and get to know your name and everything like that through them? Um, yes, but uh, you know, I'm I'm basically part time. I I have a full time job, and the bulk of the auditioning that I do is in the evening. You know, mm -hmm. I, I get in, I guess, from work around four, and I'll spend like maybe three or four hours a day after I get off work doing that. So, you know, and, but what I'm doing is I'm setting myself up because I only have a couple years before I retire. And when I'm able to go in full blast and full speed, then, you know, I'll already have my presence established and I'll go from there. You know, I, I don't know um, what some of these guys' process is for if you're doing it full time. And that's your only source of income. I guess when that's the case, then you have to hustle. And, yeah. and you know, you got to go to the conventions like Amber. Is it Amber? Yeah. Was saying that Amber was saying. And, you know, you have to put yourself in a position where people are going to see you. Mm. You know, audio books, take a shot at doing some of them. It's a long process. A lot of times it doesn't pay out the way that you think that is going to, you know, but um, if you have, a, if you're in a position to establish your name in a iTunes format or Amazon format, then that helps. Huh. So here's another question. Blogs, yay or nay? Huh. I would say <laughs> yes if you have time. <clears throat> okay. You know, and, and that's, why, why I feel so? like I'm always fighting time. It's just one of them things. If you got time to sit there and write a blog, you got time to audition. <laughs> I'm gonna agree with that. Actually, I I'm not sure I would I would say no to blogs. I think at this point, I kind of feel like they're on their way out, as opposed to podcasts or you know something where they can actually hear you. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. That I mean, podcast. I've always thought of this myself. Anyway, is uh, um, I would rather be voicing it mm -hmm. than typing it. Yes. Because then that's actually getting myself out there. Yeah. You know, and getting heard. Well, like the thing is, is you have somebody who, like uh, Paul Strick Werda, who is a very prominent blogger in the VO industry. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is that I've gone to his site to check out his blog. I've read some of the things there, but I will. I, I, it, it doesn't interest me at all to hear his demo. Huh. Like I, I don't. I don't know if, if that's if that's just my crazy idiosyncrasy or anything, but I honestly think that blogs are more distracting on your website than anything else. Because well, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say that 
I, I believe that it is too. You know, if if we all know that websites, they uh, either they capture your attention in the first few minutes and draw the person in for interest, or they don't, and they keep going. You know, yeah. so um, if if I have time to sit there and read a whole long blog, I'm probably not doing a whole lot. Yeah. You, you know, so yeah. but you know there are on occasion like places like LinkedIn where you'll find stuff that that give you business savvy in other areas too yeah so it's you know i'm glad that people do blog because they put a lot of information out there it's just not for me yeah i heard jonathan tilly say something on one of his spots that he does on youtube and it had to do with keeping your blog Separate from your voiceover website. Yes, yes. That if you are going to blog, keep that completely separate. Something that nobody looks at unless they're looking at your blog. You know. Yeah. And and that I would I am totally in agreement with that because, um, in as as I've as I've already mentioned and I will I will officially state this in my opinion I feel that a blog on a voiceover website is a waste of time. Um, simply because the main reason for your website is to be able to show off your work and to be able to get a potential, um, you know, a, 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 I don't know, wh whatever you're trying to do, maybe a potential um, uh, agent or, or a potential client interested in your ability behind the microphone. And these people who have blogs attached to their sites, I, I think it's just a big distraction. I feel it's a, it's a major waste of time and, and, and resources on your website because... If I was going to uh, build my ideal website, I think the first page should be focused solely on your demo because that's going to be the first thing that anybody sees. They should see your face and your demo. Maybe a quick little blurb, maybe a little something. Um, then uh, the secondary page, like if somebody was going to be like, okay, well, how do I contact this person? I think having... Um, the uh, a contact page be like the next thing over if not you know constantly available on every page like a little a little window to email or or, or message or something um, <clears throat> because if, if you think about the people you really want seeing your site they don't want a bunch of fluff these are people like casting agents these are people like uh, directors like you know the, the people who are really in tune in the industry like you, you want them to focus on you as a performer. So you're going to want your first page to be focused on your demo and your abilities. Your second page, I would say, would be credits. And here's why. Because right, you know, almost as important as your demo is, is what you can do for these people. Is your, is your, you know, or, or should I say the history of what you've done for uh, people like them. Um, the the main thing is, is is getting them to envision themselves hiring you. So I, I would say that uh, that having the stuff you've been published in, mentioned in, uh, interviews, um, maybe even a link to st other stuff that you've produced, like blogs or anything, that could be there, but not directly as part of the page. Um, Oh, what, what was I going to say after that? <laughs> I was on a roll, and then I totally screwed myself up. <laughs> you know, if you're, um, if, and I'm going to just help you out a little bit. If, if you're running a website and you do character voices, then one of the, um, the things that I would suggest is, you know, have, have an idea of what that character is supposed to look like. And post a picture with it, and yeah. have the voice that you created for that character as part of, you know, not necessarily a demo, but as a audition for a person to see that you can actually bring that character to life and give them some personality. I think that that would help too. <clears throat> yes, yes, absolutely. And that I would totally say, put it on your credits page or your resume page. That'd be great. Uh, having that representation there. Oh yeah, that's right. 
The last thing I was going to say is I think the third page would be a what is voiceover page. I think every voice actor should have something on their page, on their, on their websites, about what exactly voiceover is and how it can help the people you're working with. Because you can say you're a voice actor, you can say you can make them sound good, but if they don't know what exactly it is they're going to be getting from you, then it, it doesn't give them much incentive to hire you anyways. So I have okay, so I have a couple of friends, uh, a couple of friends of mine that I met who are film producers, and um, both of them have hired me um, intermittently to do voiceover work for them. And uh, at the beginning, both of them were kind of like I told them that I could, you know, I could do this VO work for them. I told them I can help them out with videos and whatnot. And uh, even though they are Filming and producing videos, they, they still weren't 100% certain about what the VO could do for them. So it was up to me to educate them as to exactly why, why my services would be useful to them. Um, I, I think everybody's website should have something they can reference like that for two reasons. One... If anybody comes onto your site, even by accident, and they see what's voiceover, well, let's give it a little click, maybe. I don't know. It could be a little hook. But two, if, so, if you are, like, face-to-face -face talking to somebody, and you're telling them all about what you can do, uh, and they're thinking, maybe even they're, they're open enough to ask, um, you know, why, why should I hire you? Why, why should this be something that I, that, that, that I should pay you for? Um, if you have something to link them to in your site, you instantly have them going to you for necessary information. You know, one of the... Um, I, I was uh, trying to get picked up by an agent. And, you know, they... I, I think one of the things that they made very clear was that if I wasn't willing to invest in classes, then I wouldn't be able to be represented. Yeah, that's yeah. Not, definitely. So it's, it's like a trade. And I feel like if you felt like I was good enough to be a part of what it is that you're working on, then, you know, I don't expect the, the training to come for free, but, you know, kind of like a mentor situation. And, and maybe that's unrealistic in this field, but um, I, I'm, you know, you know, everybody wants you to pay for something nowadays, coaching or classes or headshots or you know something, and but they're not guaranteeing any results. So when I looked at when they came and looked at my website, which is what I was getting back to, is that I I, I produce music too. Not not anything extravagant, just stuff for uh, music beds, for voiceover. You know, when you're doing voiceovers and you need music, you don't always, you can't always use something that, you can't use anything that's copyrighted unless you have permission. So a lot of times in the jobs, they'll state that they need music and they want something original. So that's one of the things that I was working on. And the uh, agent told me, that I had to separate them, and I and I I didn't understand that. I thought that you know, if if you can offer additional services, why would you separate the two, when both of them have the the intent for the same use? Hmm. So you know you got to take a lot of the information that you're getting, even with, um, from people that are professional, with a grain of salt. Yeah. I've always believed that. Um, but I, 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 one of the things that I want to go back to, I really like what you said about how sometimes they will, uh, like, um, some agencies and whatnot will require you to uh, to take classes. And I, th I, I hope one of the things that I know I stressed a lot earlier on, which I need to restress, is to. Always find, you know, whenever possible, always find professional training 
you know, places that will offer you professional training because that will only ever help you. Um, I, I think one of the biggest benefits that comes from it is if you do have somewhere where you're going regularly for training, you're constantly immersing yourself in it. And it's kind of like the idea of being in school or, or not being in school. Like, um, for instance, kids who are in school now, they can explain to you and use the Pythagorean theorem perfectly. I mean, that's what they've been studying. But let's take all of us at our different areas in life. Like, we haven't had to worry about A squared plus B squared equals C squared for any reason whatsoever. So it's not something we're involved in. It's something that kind of fades away and gets lost. The more you're you're involving yourself in reading scripts, in in interpreting them, in getting feedback from other places, it'll only help you. It'll really only help you. So I am and have always been a huge advocate of that specifically. That would be a great benefit to your business, especially especially if you go to um, I know at least in uh, down here in Irvine there is a um, a studio called Delmar Media Arts, which I went for my voiceover training. And oftentimes, they will have agents and casting directors and people come in for, like, last days of class to review your um, review your final performance and, and help grade you on how good you did. It's, you know, it, it's incredibly useful. Yeah, so, something yes, like that is great. Yeah, always, always look for, whenever possible, any kind of training you can. That's, that's, again, one of the reasons why I started the mic check, because um, I feel that it's important to have that kind of involvement in voiceover as much as possible. The kind of involvement where you are really, where you're reading the scripts, where you are, you know, doing the interpretation, where you're hearing back from people, like, that is super helpful and super useful. So, yes, one of the main things you can do for your personal business is training. Hey Mike, you know what? And, and it's funny you say that. Um, when when I first started, I didn't I didn't have any idea what I was doing. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm and I'm in the Philadelphia area. So I was started looking in that market to find out if there were people that were available to do training. Mm -hmm. And without smearing anybody's name, you know, the, the first um, place that I went, it was a supposedly a reputable um, agent. But their specialty wasn't voiceover. Oh. You know, so I go in and I sit through like a little short interview and they say, um, you know, you're going to need a demo and we could do the demos here and it's X number of dollars. And, you know, but they were really trying to push me toward doing um, ad work. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not here for ad work. I'm here for voiceover. You know, so they did the demo and... I got it, and I was like, hey, this is a really great deal because I've seen, you know, um, some of the prices that they wanted other places, and I submitted it to another agent, and they told me, they was like, well, you know, we haven't used this demo format in years. So, you know, basically, I just shout out, uh, like, close to 300 bucks for nothing. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I ended up going to a little old guy that is in Philly, and he had worked in um, in Warner Brothers Studios, and um, he he started actually training me, and I got more bang for my buck just by you know going to somebody that had some a uh, little background but was a, a little less known. So you know, it is a, a double-edged sword where. Everybody is not a great teacher, and everybody can't do what they say that they can do. And then some of the people that don't profess to be the greatest will teach you the most. Yeah. Yeah, it really... I, I think if you are going to be looking for, for training or for demos or anything like that, you, reputation is a huge thing. Um, but just... I, I like what you said, bang for your buck. You know, sometimes... The, the, a price tag for something will be really off-putting, but it will probably be one of the most worthwhile things you do if you you know if you've done your research right. Because when I was getting my demo produced, um, and again this is I'm trying to focus on the whole bang for your buck thing. 
when I was getting my demo produced, um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to do it at Del Mar Media Arts. You know, the people who trained me this whole time. Um, it would have been how much was it? I think it was fourteen hundred for the demo. That they, they they take care of the whole demo and the recording and everything. Plus, uh, I believe it was like forty or forty five copies of it to to hand out. And uh, while that that's <laughs> quite a few copies of it, the, the the main problem is is none of the agents that I've ever talked to or connected with, and I've been trying to connect with a, a lot of them via LinkedIn and, and, and Twitter and things like that to try to actually get this information from them, nobody listens to CDs anymore. None of them. It's all email submission. It's all online. Yeah, so right. while I would have had a lot of copies to give out, I would have no one to give them to. Um, then there was a small studio... Uh, that's near my home, who would do it for, I believe it was 800 is what they quoted me, which is probably the best price that, that I was quoted for, for a demo. And um, they would do all the production, they would do everything, they would give me the digital copy as well as like two master copies, but that was it. The next question is, how do you go about contacting you know, agents? What agencies do you go to? Who's really prominent? Who isn't? What would be where would it be worthwhile to actually give my demo? And uh, I would have been just left high and dry with that on my own. But then uh, I found this guy, Chuck Duran, out here, who if you ever, ever, ever want to get a demo produced, if you ever want to make it in the VO industry, I would highly suggest either looking to get your demo from him or, I, I don't know, somebody who's like him. Because... His package was expensive. It's at the time that I got it, it was eighteen hundred. But included in it, not only was the demo, but was business coaching. He would review my website, help me build it, give me resources to build the website. He would uh, link me in with um, uh, the agencies he knew were uh, were good and professional, and would essentially mentor me through the entire process. That's bang for your buck. <laughs> that was bang for my buck because it's been over a year since I got my demo from him, and he is still checking up on me. That's good. Yeah. So I would highly suggest when you are uh, – well, there are certain things in your voiceover business that you can get away with doing as cheaply as you can. For instance, your home setup. If it sounds good, that's the most important part. It doesn't matter if you have a Shure PG-42 or – uh, a freaking Neumann U87, a three thousand dollar microphone. You know that you can do inexpensively. That's fine. You're normally only going to be doing um, auditioning through your home setup, normally. Um, at least if you're if you're really hunting for agencies. But um, when it comes to things like your demo, there is no way you can cut costs on that, because it'll only hurt you in the end if you look for the cheapest way to do it. Because then you'll get exactly what you pay for, something cheap. So one of my major business tips is save up to get your demo and your startup done right. Otherwise, you're going to be in a world of pain. Michael, just as a point of reference, that is a, an actual fair price to, for the production of a demo. Some people are out there charging $5,000. Well, there you go. <laughs> Tom, where did you get your demo produced? demos produced? <laughs> you're not going to like what you hear. I produced my own demos because okay. I've, been a I've been a producer for, gosh, over 30 years. Well, here's the thing, though. Now, you what I've done since then, though, is I've uh, taken classes with the Voice Acting Academy with Jim and Penny, you know, James Allberger and Penny Abshire, mm -hmm. and I've had them give me their input on what I should include, and I've tweaked and adjusted my demos accordingly with their professional advice. Well, you see, the, the thing the thing is, is if you know what you're doing, that that's the other thing. A lot of people, like a lot of self-produced demos, they, they they just aren't exactly sure what it is that they're doing. Uh, the first first demos that I put out were strictly, uh, you know, they just strictly wouldn't fly. And then <laughs> I, you know, I it's the same thing because I came originally from a radio background. I had to make the transition 
to voiceover, which is a totally different medium and a totally different uh, career. <laughs> it's funny. You, so that's, that's the exact opposite of what of what uh, Amber is doing. <laughs> <laughs> She's going from voiceover to radio. But anyway, keep going. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but like you producing your own demo, I mean, you, you've had the experience to know what what can sound good and what can't, and you you look for professional input, which is important. Right. But, I did uh, not do it all on my own. Yeah. You know, I, had, I did the actual production, the actual voicing on my own. But then, you know, like I said, I was off mark when I first put them together, and I have since adjusted them with the professional advice of the Voice Acting Academy. Well, there you go. Well, I think we covered a pretty nice range of topics here. Does, does anybody have any questions or anything else that they would like to say or, or you know, share or anything? Uh, the one thing I would like to share is that if you can find it, uh, if you can get the, the information that Harlan Hogan puts out, he has a, a he has a process that he describes uh, how to screen somebody to do your professional demo. Oh, and what makes you know, and what makes a qualified demo producer and the questions you should ask. So he has that. Uh, you know, if you go to his website, he's got all kinds of things there, and I think it's either there somewhere or you can find it, you know, on his information on YouTube or whatever. So there you go. Um, a good. Uh, by the way, just you know, for the benefit of those who don't know who Harlan Hogan is, he's been in the business making six-figure income for over 30 years, consistently over six figures. Uh, he's one of the Keebler what? elves. Yeah, he's one of the Keebler elves, uh, and he's been doing uh, you know voiceovers out of Chicago forever. Good mercy. Yeah, so he's, he's, he's definitely incredible. Voices. He's, a, he's definitely a credible source of information. Okay. Well, there you go. There's another good source for people out there. Harlan Hogan. All righty then. Well, I think that was. A, I think we had a pretty good discussion today. Yeah. No, um, if you guys ever have uh, have anything that you'd like to that you'd like to discuss or or bring up or or that you'd like to put, I don't know out there for, for us to, to kind of talk about, then uh, feel free to email me or message me. My personal email address is my first name, Michael, last name Montez, M-O-N-T-E-S, V-O, as in voiceover, at gmail.com. So feel free to send me an email to ask questions, to, heck, if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one time with me to listen to how you sound and maybe get some input, feel free to do so. Um, the, the mic check is always free. It's always open. It's, it's ready and available. You have the opportunity here. And um, uh, I'm always willing to discuss and help out with, uh, with whatever I can, whether it be uh, demo critiquing or even looking at the websites, wh whatever, whatever it may be. If you guys ever want any input, anything like that, feel free to contact. Feel free to whatever. Even if you just want to say hi, tell me your favorite fart joke. I don't care. Uh, no. Contact. <laughs> hey, hey, Mike! Before you go, right? Uh -huh. I would like like to ask one question. Yeah. What outside of your mic, right? Uh -huh. What equipment do you find or use that you think is essential to your business? Um, are, are you talking about recording, or are you talking about yeah. actually finding work? Re recording. Okay. Um, let's see. If we want to keep it as simple as possible, one of the most important things to have is a boom stand for your mic. Not just a not just a stand up mic stand, but a boom stand. The reason being is that you sound more natural when you're standing during your recordings. Uh, but I know that some people have physical limitations that won't allow them to do that. But uh, as much as possible, I think standing or being as upright as you can during recordings will uh, will give you a better sound. Um, when it comes to sound dampening, I actually <laughs> I got the Harlan Hogan Porta Booth Pro, which mm -hmm. I think is absolutely fantastic, but it is three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, honestly, the least expensive thing you can do uh, for good recording would be 
heck, record in the closet. <laughs> Anything that's got cloth, uh, r ruffled cloth, not, not flat cloth, because flat cloth can still uh, reverberate or reflect sound. But you want uh, something loose, something ruffled, something that'll, um, that'll dampen the sound behind you. Simply because I I've seen people uh, with their own idea of what sound dampening is, uh, where they have like something that is behind the microphone, but it's open, pointing at the person who's recording. That doesn't make much sense. Specifically because the area that the microphone is most sensitive is right in front of it. So if you put the sound dampening behind the microphone, you're, you're beating a dead horse, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, the, the microphone is not going to hear anything clearly behind it. So you want as much sound dampening behind you as you can. Well, so I think, and I, I actually, I have a mic shield, and I think that the purpose of the mic shield is to actually dampen what goes out into the air as opposed to having it reflect back. Not necessarily yeah. to the mic, but in the, it cuts down on the reverb of the room as well. Yeah, and, and that, it can, but if you have, even if you, you can even do it as, as inexpensively as a room divider and a blanket. Um, in fact, that's what I did for some time. I just had a room divider with a blanket behind me. And um, if you want to, when, when I have my site back up, you can go check out some of the other videos that I've, po that I've done. And um, e there is no reverb. There is no anything like that. And I have flat walls and uh, wood flooring. So, um, well, yes, it, it can cut down on reverb depending on how small the room is. If your room is large enough, I, I don't think you have that much to worry about, especially if you have the sound dampening fairly close to you. Um, but, yeah, a, a half-decent microphone, too. I mean... You, you don't have to go all out and get a uh, like a TLM 103 or or a uh, my, uh, Sennheiser MKH 416. I mean, while, while those are amazing microphones, you can still get decent recording quality off of other microphones. It just depends on your room acoustics after that. Right. So the essentials for recording would be a microphone, a decent PC or Mac if you can afford one or if you already have one, Macs are the industry standard right now. Um, and sound dampening behind you as the, uh, as the artist. At least, at minimum. Because any reverb or things like that, you can actually take care of even in Audacity. You said you cannot. No, you can. You can limit those noises. In fact, um... My recordings normally have a lot of ambient sound to them, but I've gotten very, very good at using noise removal on Audacity. And by very, very good, I just mean I figured it out. <laughs> and uh, the recordings come off clean. Hmm. So, it, although like, the, the most basic, basic, basic thing you can do for your... Uh, for your recordings is just educate yourself. Talk to people, go on YouTube. There's so much information that's free and available out there, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. almost like there's no excuse for you not to figure it all out. Yeah, I do a lot of YouTube myself. There you go, man. And you sound good. Like your your whole setup sounds good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> like if, if this if, if our if our hanging out is any indication of it, yeah, your 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 setup sounds totally fine. So yeah, the, the main thing you can do for your recording is educate yourself. Then get your microphone and your sound dampening and things like that. But, yeah, get, get to know what you're doing first. Yeah, and I would say that even if you're in a closet, um, a yeah. couple of really good, inexpensive moving blankets hanging from the sides and the back of it wouldn't hurt either. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Especially if you can, uh, like, scrunch them up a little bit so they're nice and ruffly. Yeah. That's what I've got I, hanging in here. <laughs> there you go. 
I've got, well, I've also got some acoustic foam, but, uh, well, that's thanks to having a very generous boss. Thank you, Theron, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> I have a very generous wife. She actually made me a, um, like a sound dampening blanket that I can put over the room divider. I still haven't gotten rid of the room divider. Like, there's no reason to. <laughs> but uh, we had some extra audio foam because I, I tried to build my own portable booth thing before, and uh, that was an absolute disaster. Yeah. Um, because Done even with myself. audio foam inside of this box that I had, it still sounded like a box, period. Yeah. Oh, you heard that when I did it, um, back when I first started, because oh, I had yeah. asked about my, my, how my sound was coming through. But, uh, I had found these moving blankets, and a uh, uh, nice little ad for Harbor Freight, but they do a great job with selling these things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but, oh! Somebody who you definitely want to talk to when it comes to your uh, your studio and your sound is um, Dan Leonard. Go to um, homestudiomaster.com, and Dan Leonard he will even do one on ones with you. That's what I did originally for my uh, for my home studio. I contacted him, and um, I don't know how am I sounding right now. You sound good. If Pretty I'm, good. If I'm sounding decent. It's thanks to him. Yes. You know, it's funny you should say that because George Whittem is the guy that partners up with him, and he's out there on the West Coast. So yeah. <laughs> you're on the West Coast, and you call the East Coast. But, uh, yeah, well, either one of them will work. They're both good, <laughs> both Dan Leonard and George Whittem. Yeah. Well, uh, while we're on the subject of that, when I started out, I found, you know, I found out that I had no budget, of course. Starting from ground zero, you know, it was like, what do I do for, you know, sound dampening? And I found on eBay a dozen very large moving blankets, moving pads, you know, for $87.50. And I constructed double layer sound blankets, you know, all around myself. So I built a booth out of that. And you paid too much, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> I, screwed them, I screwed them to the rafters and hung them that way, you know, around my, uh, around my workstation. And away we went, you know, and it, it works pretty doggone good. I still got them there. I had to be very creative here because I'm renting. Um, so what I did was I found those tall clothing racks, and I've got them pinned up on the clothing racks. And uh, it's, it's a nice configuration because it actually literally built a booth around me. How do I find it? And yeah, I, th I think just, that was uh, so well. Somebody else too. Somebody um they they were on a a blog basically, and they asked a question about how they could get um you know I guess dampening the sound, and I said you know that that works just as well. Just a old fashioned clothing rack with uh, a couple of the uh, the clips that you use for file holders to yep. hang it over the rack, and off you go. Yeah. And to think, I started with a futon and a towel. Hey, whatever <laughs> works, man. I had a very large futon uh, in a kind of a strange folded arc over top of the desk, and then I would lean under the towel into the microphone. And, uh, so, and then, of course, I mentioned to my boss, well, I got this project. He said, "Really? You need some acoustic foam, don't you?" <laughs> so, the rest is awesome history. <laughs> I cut well, up a mattress topper for my closet, but I didn't even think about putting it. Um, I didn't even think about putting it behind me, which I'm gonna have to do now. Dang it! Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, especially that—that's a good example. Especially since you have a video of your recording space right now, you have sure. a wooden door behind you. That is a freaking mirror. Like I didn't, I didn't think about that. Like that, that is going to reflect all kinds of sounds back at you, especially if you have your computer in there. It's going yeah, to hear the, it's going to hear the fan noise yes. and reflect it back into you, you know, into that. Mm. Um, you, you don't need to put anything over the computer. Like the uh, ambient computer sounds can easily, easily be removed with noise removal. Mm. Easily. Yes. yes. Or um, if you can route the cables, um, just put the computer just outside your booth. What? If it's possible to route the cabling and 
Uh, well, you read your scripts off of? Oh, I've got the monitor in here, but I have the actual. Uh, oh, you don't use a Mac. Outside the boot, no. I, okay. No, the only Mac I have is uh, about thirty years old. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's a pretty decoration on my shelf in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so the only Mac I have goes with cheese, you know, Mac and cheese. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Nice. Uh, well, I, have I have a, live without mine. <laughs> I have a, I have a PC with Ubuntu Studio on it, and it works very well. Well, there you go. We got a lot of really good information here. A lot of really inexpensive things we can use in place of, you know, much more expensive things. But yeah. uh, all of us, uh, we all sound good, depending on what our system is. It's just about <laughs> educating yourself on what, you know. What what the physics are of recording is what what it looks like when when something is um, uh, like like when you when you're recording like what what where you could get reverberation from where you can get noise reflection from like it, it's just about educating yes. yourself with all that. Well, I had a problem. I had a problem with the low end being a little boomy, and it was brought to my attention. And in deference to Tom Kenny, I have two SpongeBob pillows for bass traps. <laughs> <laughs> they're that up in the corner. Awesome. <laughs> they're up in the corners behind the monitor. No, Come on, Tom. Let's do voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, one thing I would recommend though is as your career progresses and you start making, you know, more you know, more of a profit, let's say, with your business. As you start turning a profit, it does pay to invest in more professional sound yes. materials. Yes, 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 it yeah. does. Um, yeah. The main thing is, is if you're not, is is by the end of it, if you make enough money and you're not investing in yourself, you're you're not, you don't believe that you can make it. Huh. Wow, it, it it's simple as that. If you're not willing to invest in yourself, in training, in updating a website, in getting new equipment, in getting better equipment, then you are showing that you don't believe you can make it, and you can. Anybody can. Absolutely. I fully believe that. <laughs> Out of all the VO I've heard lately, I believe that any voice can make it. You, you, ninety-nine percent of your success is what you tell yourself when nobody can hear it. <laughs> yep. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> you don't have to be. You don't no, have I'm to shooting. be in New York, New York. <laughs> I heard. I think uh, I'm shooting a bit high because I keep telling myself I'm going to be the next Nolan North. <laughs> I, I think you should just work on being the next Mike Montez. <laughs> I think I should be the first Mike Montez. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I'm, if, you know, it's it's good to have um, benchmarks, but for me, I, I know that there's nobody else's voice, and and that goes for all of us. Is that all of us have our own voice, and make your voice the best instead of trying to be somebody else or the next somebody else. That was actually something that they had talked about at the Funimation um, at some of their different panels was just that, you know, the fresh voices that they're looking for, they're not looking for imitations. They, ha they have no use for imitations. I thought that was really interesting. They're looking for individuals. For originals, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Like people who are themselves. I mean, someone who can't imitate Mike Montez, you know. Because I want to be the guy that smokes like seven packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> <laughs> really? Or, I want to sound like Don LaFontaine. It's funny though. We keep getting these auditions to say, "We want the sound like you know Morgan Freeman. We want you to sound like Don LaFontaine. We want this sound, you know that sound." <laughs> well. You know, you, those, you still have those to be the ones that don't really know what they want. <laughs> a lot of clients don't know what they want, that's for sure. <laughs> you know what I do with stuff like they that? Product to sell, that's all they want. <laughs> if somebody wants something else, you know, somebody else's performance out of me, I either don't audition for them or I just give them my own audition. Mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, fortunately, I'm at a point in my career now where people are starting to say, Tom, I'd like to work with you. I, you know, I really want to work with you. You know, so I'm the next uh, me. <laughs> exactly. Well, there you go. Well, 
<laughs> Except the fact that I can do impressions. I mean, that 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 does sound completely different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, Nate, I keep telling you that's Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound a lot like Jerry Lewis. <laughs> I'm a huge Jerry Lewis fan, so. Uh, I, I learn to talk like him a, just just a little bit, Mr. Director. I'm I'm trying my best to do the best that I can here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> hey, um, after the hangout, um, is there one of you guys that I could connect with? I wouldn't be able to talk tonight, but one of you guys I could connect with to talk about home studio and just things I can do to minimize noise, that kind of thing. Is there anybody who'd be willing to sure. chat with me? You can go to www.jdvoiceworks.com <laughs> and click on my contact page. Um, I put my email out there. I don't know if you wrote it down or not, but I said I'm more than willing to talk about anything. Okay. I may just hit both of you boys up because it sounds like you both are coming from different perspectives. so um, Or different setups, I should say. Yeah, it's going to be different setups, but I guarantee you it's going to be all the same ideas. Oh. Well, then, I'll contact you then. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I think this is a good time to stop. Um, the broadcast will be over, but the Hangout will not be. If you guys just want to keep talking or doing whatever, you're more than welcome to stick around or go. I'm not going to force you. But anyway, thanks to everybody who is watching. We will uh, we will continue this another time next week, next Wednesday. Awesome. Be here. See you then. Take it easy. See you thanks, guys. Man.